David was born in Waterford, I believe he's an Ardner Grainer man, but he currently lives in Oslo, Norway. Uh, he's a PhD in history from UCC and is the author of Soccer in Munster and Social History from 1877 to 1937. But this morning, David Toms is going to talk to us about Waterford's real Molly Malone's. While no songs have been written about these women, they've made their living through the hard graft of picking and selling cockles on the streets of Waterford City. Considered by some to be a barrier to more respectable and established trade, and as a health hazard to some, the cockle pickers of Waterford were actually very tough women who could handle themselves. The humble act of cockle picking is one that carries on today and is rich in local heritage, as we all know from Saulines and whatnot. And by learning about its history, we might learn to preserve its future. So, with that in mind, please put your hands together. A very, very warm Waterford welcome home to David Toms by the Hills of Carbilly, cockle picking in Waterford history. It's not the first time, and it won't be the last time that I was mistaken for a 70 year old man. Uh, but that's fine with me, I think it was born with an old soul. Um, so it's great to be home and I'd like to thank uh, Johnny Cluno uh, in particular for inviting me. Um, great excuse to come home, great excuse to drink early in the morning. Um, and it's, I've been to Booze Blas and Banter once before, I think it was about two years ago, and it was one of the best events I've ever come to in anything, anywhere in the world really. Uh, history or otherwise and I absolutely love it and it's great to be here and to be part of it um, and the thing that I want to open by saying is and I think it's important to understand it and I think this morning is a great example of it is that the first thing I wrote that I was going to say this morning is that food is a lot more than what we eat um, you know food has this function in our lives that it brings people together and I think the fact that we're all sitting around together and a big group, people who know each other, people who don't know each other, and sharing in food that's part of our own local heritage and culture, uh, I think it's a great example of how food functions far beyond just being something you put into your body to give you kind of uh, nourishment from a physical point of view, but it's also kind of social, cultural, yeah. uh, and even emotional kind of uh, nourishment as well. So I just think that's a really important thing to say, and I think that in terms of food heritage and talking about cocktail picking in particular, that's something I really want to emphasize in my uh, talk this morning. Um, you know, uh, as well as being kind of social and cultural uh, nourishment and physical nourishment, talking about co things like cockles, periwinkles and dillisk, things that naturally occur on our coasts, um, have long been a part of the furniture of my life, especially. Uh, they're as much a part of summer as school holidays were for me, uh, or sitting cold behind a windbreaker on the beach, because I don't think I was ever actually on a beach on a sunny day in Ireland in my life. <laughs> Um, cockle picking really is an activity which I associate with the Backstrand and Tremor in particular and with family days out with my father especially. Uh, and it was also, and for some people still is, uh, you know, it's a form of work uh, to go cockle picking. For me it's kind of a leisure activity, but for a lot of people it's real work. Um, you know, and in the past, especially in this city, individual women were the ones who usually did it. And most often as a means to add extra income to their households. Um, and now when I get the chance to pick cockles, I think of these women a lot uh, who made their lives by doing this uh, very difficult work, uh, you know, boiling and then selling these uh, cockles in places like Michael Street and Peter Street in the city centre. Uh, cockle picking women have been photographed, uh, they've been sung about and they've even been painted. There's a, a very famous and very beautiful painting, I think it's now in the Crawford Art Gallery in Cork, by a guy called Joseph Malachy Kavanagh. Uh, and it's a really beautiful painting of uh, women working on a strand uh, and I think it's a really fabulous but chances are he didn't know who they were and probably didn't know much about their lives uh, and so part of what I want to do today is um, kind of talk about women like that who you know you have your you know, what we could call these real life Molly Malones um, and I hope to give some insight into the place of seafood like cockles in Waterford life in the first half of the 20th century in particular. Um, just taking a quick look at the online census returns for Ireland uh, for 1901 and 1911. As far back as 1901, there were women who considered this their principal occupation, um, to be cockle pickers or sellers. Uh, for instance, there was a mother and daughter who worked together, um, and they lived in some of the lanes here in Waterford. By 1911, uh, many more women, uh, and in fact, every one of them was a woman. There was no men who were ever listed as cockle pickers on those censuses. Uh, 
they also, there was around 20 women who considered themselves this their full-time occupation in Waterford in about 1911, just before the beginning of the First World War. Uh, many of them were actually often either single or widowed, interestingly, uh, though a handful were married. And uh, again, like it was very much kind of doing this work to supplement their own uh, income uh, or sometimes of their husbands or widowers' pensions and stuff like that. Um, I think it's important to say that it was hard back-breaking work and to say nothing of also dangerous work, usually for quite poor pay. In 1911, when we still had the poor law unions, there was a poor relief case brought before Dungarvan Union of a woman called Mrs Tobin, who was a cockle picker, who because she only had one child, could not under the strictures of the law, which the guardians weren't obviously keen to bend, uh, actually be granted poor relief. Um, and this was despite the fact that uh, a Mr. Bar uh, Mr. Byrne, one of the poor law guardians, acknowledged that Mrs. Tobin's was a very deserving case. He said she was a very industrious woman. On a winter's day, it was a pity to see her coming from the Cunnagar streaming with water with the bag on her back. The lot of cockle pickers around Waterford doesn't appear to have much improved uh, when we became an independent state uh, during the Free State period. Uh, if some newspaper reports in the middle of the 1920s are anything to go by. Under the Towns Improvement Act, which was introduced in 1926, the fish market in the city was actually moved from Michael Street to Peter Street, and several women were brought before the local district courts uh, during the transitionary period for, in the phrasing of the courts themselves, exposing for sale cockles so as to create an impediment or annoyance to free passage. So the cockle-picking women who would normally bring their baskets in to sell, they weren't wanted in the new fish market uh, because the kind of more uh, established fishmongers thought they were kind of a nuisance and kind of getting in the way of their trade, actually. Uh, the case of one particular woman, which was reported in the Munster Express on the 20th of August, 1926, I think is pretty instructive about the place of these women in kind of our society. Uh, a case was brought that a, a cockle seller, a woman named Kathleen Dwyer, had created an impediment or annoyance uh, in the phrasing of the law on Peter Street. She herself described to the court her setup, which was two porter boxes, one for her cockles and one which she used as a seat. Asked by the prosecution if she thought she caused an obstruction, he also inferred that she was a heavy woman and this would add to her ability to obstruct, saying she was a substantial size of a woman. She, in her turn, because she was obviously a tough woman, replied, replied fairly baldly that nobody interferes with me. Um, so, I, not a woman I would have crossed, I have to say. Um, a witness for the defence uh, was a woman by the name of Ellen O'Brien, who was aged 64 at the time, noted that Peter Street had always been a cockle market, and that she had been doing that work there for 50 years since she was a teenage girl, which meant that the kind of use of Peter Street as a cockle market goes back to the mid-1870s at the very earliest, if not probably much further back than that, and that her parents and grandparents had done likewise before her. Uh, O'Brien argued that they should not be moved to the fish market on the street since no one would buy cockles in the newly established fish market um, because they had always actually traded separately. But the issue didn't seem to have been resolved uh, because a fortnight later, Dwyer, O'Brien and 12 other cockle picking women were all summoned to court for sale of cockles on the public street. Um, so a lot of people didn't want them uh, selling these cockles and uh, adding to their own incomes. These same women would again be prosecuted for this offence uh, right through until November when they were given a three month amnesty by the town clerk and judge to see if they would, in their idea of it, behave themselves by not interfering with the new fish market. Uh, in February of 1927, the cases were revived but adjourned because a different judge who was now in the chair acknowledged that he knew nothing of the previous uh, cases and basically didn't really seem interested in hearing them all again in full. Um, the defending solicitor attempted to elicit some sympathy for the cockle sellers uh, and their cause by pointing out their poverty and the hard work of travelling 16 mile round trips to Tremor to pick the cockles they would sell. Um, given that uh, it, there was a recent ruling, I think, by the European courts that travel to work was now considered part of work, uh, these women, I think if that had been around in their day, they would have done quite well with a 16 mile round trip. Um, at the end of the 1930s, when one cockle seller died at the age of 73, a woman named Stacia Walsh, there was astonishment uh, at the discovery of some £1,700 in all the nooks and crannies of her house. The woman, it was noted, made her living dealing in poultry and in the sale of cockles, which she gathered on the backstrand from Moore. She was apparently also regarded locally as being of somewhat eccentric habits. She might have been eccentric, uh, but she was definitely thrifty and uh, a smart woman nonetheless. 
The cockle selling, picking and eating habits in Waterford took a dive in the period uh, just before the war as there were many public health warnings being issued about contamination of the shellfish linked uh, to typhoid outbreaks which was caused by the poor sanitary conditions of the water around the back strand. Uh, this came from runoff uh, from the houses in the Riverstown area actually. The Munster Express wanted to know what it would take before the health board would insist on improving the sanitary conditions on many of the houses uh, that were thought to be the cause of the issue. In the summer of 1939, an official warning came from the town clerk, which was printed in the local press to warn people to boil the cockles sufficiently so as to ensure that they would not suffer any infections or diseases. Uh, by 1940, guidelines were issued on the subject by the corporation and the Minister for Local Government and Public Health, um, which became effective in May of that year. Under the new Public Health Waterford Shellfish Laying Regulations of 1940, People were liable to prosecution and a fine of £100 if they willfully sold or distributed cockles and other shellfish which hadn't been uh, basically properly boiled or uh, cooked and, and sort of cleaned and so on. Um, the measures also put to an end, for a while at least, the public harvesting of cockles from the back strand by people just doing it for their own kind of ends. Um, even after the introduction of these measures, the bad name gained by Tremor Cockles during this period extended to those which were also gathered uh, in Passage and the Woodstown area of the county. And notice was actually made in the local press that those sellers from that end uh, of the county got their cockles from elsewhere, but the public uh, didn't, and basically they had to say to them, look, the public doesn't need to worry if you're getting Passage or Woodstown cockles, you should be fine. It's the Tremor ones you have to watch out for. Um, despite these changes, the introductions uh, of such regulations and rules, the local press continued actually uh, throughout the 40s and 50s with stories of cockle picking of near fatalities as in inexperienced cockle pickers on holiday spent too much time at the back strand and narrowly averted the rising currents. Uh, still a danger of course, if anybody does it, you kind of have to watch the tide times pretty closely. Uh, of women casual street traders prosecuted uh, for selling their wares after hours of picking, uh, of casual pickers making a few bob on the slide during the summer months. Um, but you know, like, the reading all this stuff, uh, what it brings back is an entire world actually, uh, where this was so much more common, so much more normalized than it is now, and it's, it's becoming an increasingly rare kind of thing that a lot of people don't really do. Um, there was a poem, not probably not the most amazing poem that was ever published uh, in a Waterford newspaper or anywhere else, but I think it's kind of a nice poem because it sort of captures that, uh, that sort of world uh, that existed in Waterford probably before the 1950s. Um, and uh, the, the world depicted in the poem runs as, so it's about kind of a guy talking about, uh, as a young boy, he says that, uh, we used to go where flows the saline tide, on whose banks I have oft cockles picked, with boyish heart and glee, and played queer pranks and carefree free tricks on the hills of Carbali. Um And what I want to say is that in all, as you can kind of see from my very brief uh, romp through uh, a lot of these kind of different court cases and different things about these women that were brought up uh, and the history of cockle picking in Waterford is that the present situation where you know it's there's some dispute about whether people should have access to that laneway that lets you down onto the back strand and so on and um, it's not really a new problem actually in a lot of ways because as long as cockles have been picked and I think what I'm talking about today kind of shows that uh, as long as kind of working class women have been going picking it and and trying to make money from it, uh, there's always been people trying to prevent them either from picking it or from selling it then on the streets. Um, and it is a long-standing tradition, and the current attempts to reduce our access to the backstrand, uh, I think, can only be seen and understood and fought against as uh, one more attempt in a long line of attempts to prevent people uh, from engaging with and enjoying their own food heritage and culture. Uh, so thanks very much for having me along, and I hope you enjoyed the talk. Thank you. Very insightful talk there.